So I want to introduce you to our panel right now. It's a tight fit, right? It's cozy? It's good. It's great. Cozy. Love you. <laughs> okay. Um, so you already know Tyler Tamir. Of course, he's the CEO of San Francisco AIDS Foundation. I'm sure that you know Scott Weiner, California State Senator. And uh, someone that I've not met, but I'm just so happy to finally meet, Diane Havler from UCSF. Um, and she'll be talking about all her, all her great work that she's been doing for so long on HIV and AIDS. And I'm also really happy to have Ellis Jones here. He comes all the way from Mississippi. He is with the Prevention Access Campaign. Um, please welcome all of our panelists. <laughs> LS, let's start with you because this video really spoke to the way that HIV and AIDS has always impacted the black community. We are very concerned about what's happening in the South because of the stigma that still exists. And we see from these voices in that video how much stigma has a very real impact on health. What is happening in Mississippi right now? Before I answer that, I'd like to center myself in this way. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All along my tedious journey, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. What is the journey in Mississippi? I need Jesus to walk with me as, a, as an African-American clergy person of faith who was diagnosed with HIV in July of 2014 with the immediate realization that this meant quite possibly the end of a life that I prepared to live from a child. When you're called to ministry, in the black culture, especially in the South, that calling is often identified in childhood. And there are lots of stipulations and pressures and expectations that were placed upon my life. And I knew that there were certain things that were not to be touched as a, just a black person of, of the Christian faith. Uh, in the South period, there are things that we don't touch. And I remember sitting in a very small room after being given my diagnosis and wondering, God, what will I do with this? I'm a concert vocalist. I'm a graduate of Tougaloo College and I'm prepared to go and travel the world and give concerts and, and I'm still a preacher and I'm all of these things. and. Being a Mississippian diagnosed with HIV in 2014, I said 2014 had the same impact as if I had been diagnosed in 1984. Um, for the first two years, I was socially isolated, totally in denial, and everything was okay, so I thought. Um, but when I became very ill, cryptococcal meningitis, meningoencephalitis, and several other opportunistic infections, and it landed me in the hospital and I had to figure out a way to tell this community of folks who've watched me grow up as the little preacher and wearing suits and speaking and traveling and doing all of these things that this is now my life. Um, isolation, rejection, stigma. These are words that became like a glove to me. I had to get comfortable with that reality. I had to get comfortable with the reality that as Mississippians, especially black Mississippians, and I'll come to a close, we keep secrets. And so this would mean not just a shame on me, but my family, my church, my culture, my everything. It, it, it was a shutdown to life, literally. And I had to figure out a way to work with that. 
Now, unfortunately, in 2022, someone just got diagnosed with HIV in Mississippi recently. And the very things that I experienced in 2014, the very things that someone else experienced in 84 and 94 is still our current reality. So I hope that's the best way that I could answer that. What's going on in Mississippi? Tyler, we saw you in the video and I met your mom in the spring and she's lovely. But, I, but we also heard from a lot of people in this video about disappointment. I kept hearing that word disappointment come up. And it's, that's such a powerful thing to hear because you've been given this diagnosis and you have so many concerns about your own physical and mental health. But the mind immediately jumps to what's mom and dad gonna think? What's grandma gonna think? What's the pastor gonna think? What's the neighbor gonna think? And that disappointment seems to be very poisonous. Is that something that you are still hearing about, dealing with? How do we deal with that? Yeah, I think that's still just such an incredibly prominent uh, uh, part of people's stories, um, really depending on where you live, the family or culture that you grew up within. All of those things play a crucial factor in how your own journey with HIV may go. I was um, in a very, um, privileged place that I had uh, an amazing mother, Mama T, for those who know her um, and have met her. Uh, but even my own journey of figuring out how I would tell her um, was a difficult one. I think we have a lot to think about when we're disclosing our status, our own uh, safety, the stigma that exists within our community, um, whether that's our cultural community or even um, among other gay men for myself and how I would tell people around me. And I think um, remembering back to the day that I decided to tell my mother, which was actually very early on, um, I knew that I needed a system of support. <clears throat> I felt comfortable and safe enough to do that, which so many people don't. But I think the thing that is common for almost anyone is that often we become the people who all of a sudden in talking about a life-changing diagnosis are comforting the people around us in that moment. Um, and it's one of the hardest moments of your own experience. So I think even in telling my mother, um, who has been my rock since that first day, my greatest fear wasn't, um, luckily for myself, wasn't will I be disowned? Will I not have a place to live? Will I face stigma or rejection like so many others I know have? It was, how will I support her? Um, how will I support the people in my life through this? Um, which is something we need to figure out how to shift um, over, over time. Dr. Havler, at UCSF, when you're looking at the populations, not just locally, but also, also nationwide, where is your focus right now when it comes to making sure people have, we have treatment. We have treatment that allows people to live long and healthy lives. We have treatment that's, that's preventing so many people from even getting HIV. But if you're not getting that treatment, if you're not aware of it, then it's useless to, to these communities. So where are we on that? Well, I think one thing we know is, which has been brought up, for example, in San Francisco, our infec infection rate has dramatically decreased. Now the highest proportion of people who are being infected are Latino or Latinx and also the black community. We have to ask ourselves, why is that? We, we can't be blaming clients, it's us. It is the medical health system. And somebody described to me once that our hospital was like, well, if you get shot, it's great you go there and you get good care, but there's like a moat around it. It doesn't feel accessible. And in fact, all of our health care can be very, very complicated to access. So when we think about a pandemic, I always tell people, and this is whether I'm teaching, it takes a community to end a pandemic. And if you want to know how to reach communities, the communities know the answers. And what has been, what's happened in San Francisco is we have created partnerships such as Getting to Zero, which Senator Weiner was, we were all involved with from the beginning. And the idea here is you take people who have technical scientific expertise, I'm a doctor, I'm working on the science, you take the community, they know what's happening. Every community is different. I think Cleve said there's no one size fits all. 
Okay? And then you have to have policy makers and people like our mayor who make very courageous decisions. And you need the private sector. We need new products. We need drugs. And we need to bring all those people together under the tent to work together to say, okay, we are not reaching people because we have great treatments. How do we do that? And how do we fund it? And how do we sustain it? it, it it's just, I came to San Francisco, I'm a person that runs towards the fire. I read the first report, I was at Duke, and I got accepted at UCSF, and I got in my Honda, I drove across the country, and my colleagues said, oh, you don't wanna go to San Francisco? There's all these AIDS patients. I'm like, that's where I'm going, okay? And I think this is such a special place, and seeing the evolution, now we have treatments that, you know, one pill once a day, one injection every two months, one pill a day for of treatment, the fact that we have not provided the opportunity for people to access that, we, we, everybody in this audience needs to change that. Also, if I can just say on, on your behalf, uh, during the COVID pandemic, during the height of it, um, Dr. Havler was one of the people who was largely responsible to come into my neighborhood, which is the mission, and share her expertise, not just scientifically, but also to discover how do we communicate with, a, with people who are, who are unable to get this message otherwise? And how do we get the testing? And how do we get the treatment? And you did so by listening. And it seems like that was hugely successful in the mission. So I just want to thank you for that, but also remind us that that is the way that we you know, go forward in, in any pandemic. So thank you for saying that. Um, Scott Weiner, so you worked on th this mission to decriminalize the, the spread of HIV, which I think seems, when we talk about it now, barbaric, that that was ever even, even the case. So that check accomplished. What's next? So um, first of all, it's an honor to be here with all these amazing uh, leaders. Uh, and um, you know, I, I just want to say, first of all, I think it's less about the healthcare system and it's more about government. Um, and not the city of San Francisco, but you know, state government and national government, that we do not have a public health system in this country that is designed to stop the spread of infectious diseases. And we saw that in extreme ways around COVID. But what the fact that we have any, the fact that we have even one new HIV infection ever in this country, it's much more outrageous than COVID. Co COVID is really hard to stop spreading. We know that even with the vaccine, in terms of the spread, it's really hard. It's hard for people to sort of protect themselves. HIV, we know exactly how to just drop the wall down and, and just end all new infections. If, if everyone who's at risk is on PrEP, if everyone knows how to get PEP if they think they've been exposed, if everyone gets regular easy testing and then gets, like we do in San Francisco, if you're positive, you put them in a cab down to SF General and put them on the meds right away so that you are no longer infectious, we would wipe out new infections like that. But although we do that fairly well in San Francisco, which is why we've dropped new infections so much, in most parts of this country, that's not happening. In the vast majority of this country, that's not happening. In a large majority of California, that's not happening, let alone other parts of the world. And, and the fact that in the vast majority of California, it is hard to get an HIV test. I'm lucky, I can walk down the strut two blocks from my house and get an HIV test pretty much any day I want to. Most of California, it's hard to get an HIV test. And you get an HIV test, you test positive, you don't necessarily know what to do. You may have physicians who, who don't know. For most people, so many, even just gay men who don't know about PrEP, it's outrageous. And that is a, a failure in our system. Uh, and, and in terms of, and, and so we need to build out HIV and other STI uh, testing capacity and quick access to treatment and education. And that's why the, the ending the epidemics coalition uh, that Dr. Havlier and, and the, the AIDS Foundation are part of, and we work with all the time, we're trying to get more resources in California to be able to spread that out. I do just wanna add in terms of HIV decriminalization, um, because it's really one of, to me, it's so disheartening. We, 
Uh, when I came into the Senate in 2017, for the, when we had all these draconian felonies around people living with HIV. Uh, if you had e Ebola or tuberculosis or another serious disease, the, the worst that could happen if you don't tell your, someone that you're, and you, you expose someone, is that it's a, a misdemeanor, a minor misdemeanor, except HIV. It was all these series of felonies. You could go to state prison. And it, it wasn't people looking like me, that looked like me that were largely targeted. It was mostly black and brown women. Uh, and it would convert uh, a sex work misdemeanor into a felony, trap women in abusive relationships with a partner or their pimp uh, that, you know, if you, if you leave me, I'm going to call the police and tell them that you didn't tell me you had HIV and you're going to state prison. Uh, that's what it was about. And so for three years before I got there, they couldn't even find an author in the legislature to do that bill. We got that bill through, it, and it has been so intensely painful for everyone involved. I still get death threats because of that bill. The way that it was portrayed about, like, you know, people who were intentionally running around trying to infect people with HIV, the demonization of people living with HIV, it shows how much work uh, we still have ahead of us on this, on this virus. Um, Reggie, if I might add, um, you know, I think um, we heard uh, medical, we heard government, but the third piece in my mind would be community. So the communities that we aren't reaching through our strategies for PrEP or other biomedical prevention, the strategies um, that aren't working to get folks uh, that need it the most into care and treatment are among those communities that have incredibly valid reasons for mistrust of government and mistrust of medical institutions over time. And community is the linchpin to get those folks into the care and treatment and, and into the prevention modalities that they need moving forward. And trust is the cornerstone of all of that. Um, you know, I think communities of color, uh, trans communities, gender nonconforming communities, trust people that look like them. And, um, you know, in 40 years of the AIDS Foundation, I am the first person of color to lead the foundation. And I'm one of very few black and brown people who are leading HIV organizations, community-based organizations across the country. I think if we're really going to make a difference in the epidemic, we need to look at our succession planning and we need to find a pathway to get more people who are reflective of the communities most disproportionately impacted into positions of leadership. And I, 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 yes, amen. I should also say, I mean, we have someone here who's in the church, right? So, the, you know, there's a powerful figure that can get in front of people and be a trustworthy source to explain what PrEP is, for example. I mean, we've been saying PrEP and we've been saying PEP, but there's still a lot, of, I mean, there's still a lot of people who don't know what that is, as, as Scott was saying. I mean, PrEP is a daily pill. It's pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a daily pill that you take in order to prevent HIV. It is highly effective. There's also PEP, which was brought up here, which is a, uh, a series of pills that you would take after exposure to HIV in order to protect yourself from be getting infected. And in addition to that, and I, I mean, I think, Dr. Havel, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but the fact that we have U equals U, which is people who are already infected with HIV can take a treatment that allows them to not be able to transmit HIV to their partners. That to me seems to be almost the biggest game changer that we've had you know, over the past several years. But I'm curious where you are, is that something that people are even, even aware of? This is a great moment and a great segue. Uh, the first question is entirely too loaded. I, I could not even begin to get into what exactly is going on in Mississippi. So professionally, I've been in this work now since 2017. I moved to Kansas City. I'd never heard of support groups. I'd never heard about all of these innovative works and conferences and things that were going on all over the country that I needed to be at, that other people in my immediate circle who had been diagnosed with HIV needed to be at. And I found that chosen ignorance is a big thing in Mississippi. 
It's a choice to not know. If I don't know certain things, I'm not held accountable. Uh, I'm gonna answer this question and speak to this in this regard. Uh, in the work that I do with Prevention Access Campaign, the parent company, if you will, of the U Equals U movement, my job every day is to go into community, whether I'm at the gas station, the supermarket, the doctor's office, any and everywhere that I go, um, and to tell people who look like me and don't look like me about U equals you. So I get to do investigative research on a daily basis. I also get to do translational scientific research. Uh, my background is that I taught school for six years in addition to being a vocalist. So I found first, Reggie, that there's a belief in Mississippi that when you get HIV, when you catch HIV, let me talk the language of, of the South, of, of, of how they say it. When you catch HIV, something happens to your brain and you become like a retarded person. Like you're looked down on, uh, like you don't understand basic information. And so there's a line that is created unconsciously that uh, people, especially of color in Mississippi, can't understand the science anyway. You couple that with the belief, the, I mean, entrenched belief that anyone who has contracted HIV deserves it because of our behaviors. That's the common rhetoric of pastors. That is why pastors won't touch the letters HIV or PrEP. Because if we say that, now we're encouraging people to go and engage in all of this risky behavior. I, I have not gotten to death threat level, and I hope I don't, but it's quite possible. But I get a growing number of uh, just oppressive and oppositional comments and commentary. I've been blacklisted from almost every church association I've ever been a part of. And in my years of being in music ministry, professional, just, just all the things that I've done in the church itself, I've served probably every denomination that black and brown folks go to in the South. I'm no longer welcome there. Uh, particularly the one that hurt the most was the United Methodist Church. So when you talk about, and when I hear what's going on here and in other places, I've felt just sorely displaced all day being here because at home, it looks nothing like this. This gathering would not look like this. It's, it's almost like the information is safeguarded because if we release all of this good information and tell people that they have worth and they have value, then the behaviors will continue. And so you, you can unpack that for days. You've got levels of homophobia in there. You've got levels of taught discrimination. I mean, just entrenched from a child. And so you take that someone like me who's growing up in all of these systems and it's how do I assimilate to be accepted in the world knowing that in other places they don't have to go through all of this. And so I'm, I'm gonna end like this. In Mississippi and in the South, because I travel all across the South, um, this chosen ignorance is, is the biggest part um, as well as, and that chosen ignorance is for a lot of reasons, mainly one being spiritual. I don't want to think about I'm having sex. Sex is a dirty word in the South, especially in church, when it can be discussed so beautifully in other places. I've heard such wonderful things here since I've been here. This is what we're missing that, what did Dr. Tamir say, that community piece? Community at home is literally about keeping secrets. And I will borrow a line from Bishop Yvette Adrian Flunder from Oakland, secrets kill. And closets were not meant for human lives. They were meant for brooms and boots and coats. And in Mississippi, closets of secrecy are very much in existence. And anyone like myself who dares to destroy and dismantle those closets can immediately become an outcast. I think that's very important to hear. <laughs> Dr. Havler. When we first knew about HIV and AIDS, I think it was the, at the time the Health and Human Services Secretary said that we would have a vaccine in two years. <laughs> it's been almost 40. Where is it? What is taking so long? Well, I'm gonna start by saying, let's think of all the positive things that we have done while we are waiting 
to get a vaccine. Um, as we've talked about, we have prevention, we have treatment, we have different kinds. We know that U equals U. And I want to mention women. M women can get pregnant, have a child, and breastfeed, and not transmit to their infants. There are amazing, amazing advances that we have made. What's left in terms of the, some of the toughest challenges in HIV, HIV cure, an HIV vaccine. I, can, I could go on and on, but I wanted this audience of scientifically why HIV is such a tough virus to make a vaccine for. Some viruses are a little bit easier than others. HIV is a tough virus on what it does to your body and what society has done to people who have it. But the only thing I can say is we are advancing with vaccines. I mean, what everybody saw in the last two years with SARS-CoV-2, the COVID vaccine, I just have to tell you was miraculous, okay? All that knowledge, a lot of it came from HIV researchers that is going to be translated for many other diseases that need vaccines. And I would say we're 40 years into it. There's no way it's gonna take 40 more years to get a vaccine. I can't say when it's gonna be, but we all should be hopeful. I appreciate that. And we also need to get people back on track to getting tested and seeing their doctors. I talked to uh, Dr. Monica, Monica Gandhi recently about that and her concern that we were thrown off track a little bit during the pandemic for understandable reasons. But uh, people, we need people to go back to the doctors in person and, and, and make sure that they're getting tested. Yeah, and just maybe one thing with that, thanks. At our mission site, one of the things we know, we shouldn't be doing solo diseases. So we have walk-up vaccines for COVID, test-free testing for COVID. We added HIV testing. Great. We added MPOX vaccines. We added diabetes. It's all about low barrier access in a community setting and people feel comfortable, trust, when you walk up the door, I trust these people. So these are other ways that we can um, increase our HIV testing and um, inviting people into the healthcare system. I could go on and on with y'all, but I, I know we have another panel to get to as well. So um, if we could just have kind of a final thought from each of you, we'll start with uh, Dr. T. Hmm. Wow, you know, <clears throat> um, World AIDS Day, uh, for me, is a great time of um, reflection. And I almost loved, um, we've had a lot of comments about the, the, the rainy day, um, but I almost love that it was raining today because um, in my family, we believe a lot in symbolism and rain um, often is symbolized as a moment of pause for introspection. And I think when I think of this day, when I think of the progress we've made in 40 years of the epidemic, um, when I think of the work, the very hard work we have yet ahead of us, um, it encompasses everything we've been able to talk about today. It encompasses our ability to reach hard, um, uh, to reach communities that have traditionally been furthest from access and opportunity by uh, building trust, by building relationships with communities of faith, by building uh, trust within medical institutions, government, and by working together. Um, what I do know is that we can see a day of zero new infections um, here in our city. Um, we cannot do that in the United States without finding a pathway to end HIV in the US South. And we can't do that without a government response that will allow them to expand their Medicaid programs. If everyone knew um, how to access resources, they wouldn't even really be able to do it um, in the South right now in the ways that they needed to. Uh, so there's a lot of work ahead and a lot of collaboration across movements that is going to be necessary during this uh, difficult political time. Thank you. Senator Wiener. Yeah, I just, to me, what I, you know, I've come from that generation. I was, um, came, of, came of age as a gay man, which is a polite way of saying started having sex. Um, in, in, you can just say it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay, I did. Um, there were, yeah. um, when I was, 17 years old in 1987, which was part of the low point, right? That there was, and, and, when, and so when I came of age as a gay man, there was a mass die-off. Truly, that's the only way to describe a mass die-off of gay men and other people. Um, and, and, and our government 
basically told us to go fuck ourselves. I'm just going to be blunt. On, on your own. You deserve this. Screw you. Die. And we need to always remember that. And what Cleve was talking about with that conversation in that bar really hit home for me because, you know, I, 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 was, I was lucky. Had I been born five years earlier, I'd probably be dead, most likely. Uh, and I came, you know, I was just there when it was still happening and I was seeing it, but I was young enough that I got the information I needed before I started having sex and was able to protect myself. And, and we need to always remember that catastrophe for our community. Um, that's why I think so many of us were on edge around MPOX, which we were able to thankfully get under control quickly, but it's still around, um, because we felt like we were once again being jettisoned off to protect ourselves. So we, as a community, need to keep our community health infrastructure strong uh, because, yes, hopefully, we, yeah, I, and, and I, I want to say hopefully we'll never have a Ronald Reagan. Now we have people who are worse than Ronald Reagan. And, and, and so we need to be prepared always to protect our own community health. Thank you. Dr. Havler. I, I want to express a note of optimism because in San Francisco and the AIDS community, we are a community of action and we are a community of collective action, and that's how you have impact. And this right here is a community of crusaders. I want to call out Dion Jones, a nurse who is at the forefront of this pandemic, and all nurses who have been working very, very hard. But I also, I just want to close with, we are not going to get where we wanted to be by doing the same thing, okay? We have to change what we're doing and face the issues ahead of us and face them together. Thank you very much. And the last word goes to LS. You know, when John came to Mississippi and, and the entire team, and they brought the notion, Kevin, I have to mention as well, brought the, motion, the notion of change the pattern. I sat with that for a while to see, just in my own mind, in my own spirit, if you will, what does that look like? Is it possible? And I've come to find that while Mississippi is, it's, it, we've got some problems, okay? That's the easiest way to say it. There's a tremendous amount of hope uh, for, for my state. And on this World AIDS Day, I want to reflect like this. I could very well be a director or program manager or running something in another place that's easy. Uh, it would be very easy to do my work somewhere else, but I choose to stay in the South, not just because it's where I was born and raised, but I too like to run to the fire. I, I too find that if I can see successes in a very oppressive and challenging place, then it's a cakewalk to talk to the, I think I've lost count, probably 15 people that I've talked to about U equals U and HIV since I've been here. If I can keep doing it in the small sectors and in the private bathrooms and in the, the very closed off spaces, today I think I've gained more fuel from being here to know that changing the pattern is realistic. Um, it feels like a far-fetched dream in Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee and Georgia and, and even the South and North Carolina and so throughout the rest of the South. But I want to close today just letting each of you know that you all have some jewels here in San Francisco. You, you've got a lot to be grateful for and I just really need us to clone all of that and shoot it to the South uh, so that we can really see a true changing of the pattern because I do not want anyone else to have to lose a relative or lose a mom like I did who wasn't even aware really of her HIV diagnosis. Her doctor never thought to test her. Uh, he said to me, your mom was a deaconess and in the church and a church lady and very clean. There's that word, clean. When my mother's doctor said that to me, it brought about a real reflection that this is what the medical community of Mississippi looks like. And so changing the pattern looks like making impact at every intersection. Where's Cleve? He said that earlier. That's what's missing 
largely in the South, is that we have not identified those intersections of where people come together and political status doesn't matter, religious class and status won't matter, background orientation and all of that won't matter. That's been achieved here and in other places, but in Mississippi and largely throughout the South, it has not. So I ask you all here in this wonderful, beautiful place to send your energy to the South so we can change the pattern. Thank you. All of you in your own way has uh, run to the fire. So I just want to thank you for that. And um, my mind and heart have expanded by sitting here listening to you and I hope yours as well. Uh, please let's hear it again for our panel. Thank you.